this is just a topic that you know interests me. I think it's cool, but um, Caroline's had a little more hands-on experience with this kind of topic before. So, do you want to get started? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, just a little bit about me. I don't have a degree in Egyptology or anything, but I think, as Marge Simpson would say, I just think it's neat. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I've always really been interested in like uh, ancient Egyptology in different media growing up. I mean, all throughout the 90s and onwards, and seeing the different evolution of that and representation in it. And then in 2017, um, I was able to take a two-week trip to Egypt uh, and go around the country, see lots of the pyramids, monuments, and the entire time I was there, any of the tour guides we had, I had a notebook and I was taking notes the entire time. Like, you would think it's like class or homework, but it was the most fun I have ever had traveling. So I really wanted to share what I learned and how it relates to some of my favorite media that I've grown up with and that has also come out recently. Okay, so what is Egyptology? Um, it is the study of language, history, and civilization of ancient Egypt. Now, you'll see us, um, you know, as you can see here, that is a very broad timeline. And it's almost hard for us to comprehend that, you know, living in CE, you know, we think about BCE, but we're talking about you know, a range of civilization with different dynasties and everything for about 3,000 years. So throughout that, there's been a lot of changes, uh, some of which we're going to note in here, how the culture kind of shifted during that time and how the different motifs are represented. So yeah, as I was saying, it's a very long history. Um, typically, ancient Egypt is categorized into three different kingdoms. Um, of course, there were a lot of different dynasties and stuff going on through each of these, but these are kind of the eras within Egyptology. So you have the Old Kingdom. Um, that is when the Giza Plateau was established. The big pyramids we recognize were made, the Sphinx was made, uh, and really those different Egyptology customs that we've learned about have uh, started. Now, the Middle Kingdom was a bit more chaotic. There was definitely more like fighting and everything, uh, but they did have more um, of like a knowledge revolution during that time. And then once we get to the New Kingdom, that's what a lot of people also associate with Egyptology. We're talking about the really ornate tombs, things like King Tut, uh, Temple, Valley of the Kings and Queens. So we're going to kind of go through some of these motifs, how they connect to these different periods, and then where they are in some of our favorite video games. So exactly, why Egyptology and video games? Well, I gave you the spiel, we think it's neat, um, and there are so many games, I mean, even what we've put in here really just scratches the surface. I think it's so cool that Egyptology is such a prominent theme among not only video games but other types of media because it's just a really fascinating subject. Um, I think they have really strong links of storytelling, and yeah, overall, I think it's cool. I think it's one of humanity's coolest civilizations that there's been. It's very pervasive. I mean, people, for, you know, all through since, I mean, during the time and onwards have been really enamored by this. So it's like you see the influence in a lot of different things and everything is a remix, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so first off, we're gonna go over some common symbols and some, uh, just knowledge share of Egyptology before we dive into the games that they're represented in. Yeah, this is the primer, so sorry if it's drinking from the fire hose. Um, we pulled a lot from Wikipedia, so feel free to take pictures and stuff, but first we have trongles. Uh, <laughs> these trongles were created during the Old Kingdom, so that's that beginning period when there was a lot of being built. Um, these were tombs for pharaohs to ascend to the heavens. Um, so a, the inside of a pyramid, you're actually going upwards because they're, where they're going to be laid to rest is going to be higher towards the sky. That's where Ra and all the good stuff is. Um, 118 pyramids have been discovered so far. There probably be more that have, you know, we'll never know. Um, 
over here, like these are the, the pyramids at Giza, the ones on the left, they're the ones that we recognize the most, but there are also a lot of step pyramids, which are the ones on the right. Um, these were considered the beta version of the smoother ones with fewer polygons, um, more people recognize. Um, and an interesting thing about the pyramids here is that the pyramids at Giza had an outer layer of white limestone uh, when they were built. So they had a coating where it's like they were more bright white. Most of that has eroded away, except for the top of the pyramid, you can still kind of see like a little bit of icing on top. So that's a little fun fact for you. A really good example of this is if you look at the set, I think Lego came out with it about six months ago. There's a pyramid and it has the white limestone and then you can pop off the top of it with the more rugged looking. I know this because I bought that on release, of course. <laughs> Next we have, uh, y'all have probably seen obelisks. Uh, they're these big pencil things. Uh, they have commemorative text on them. Uh, they're usually an homage to the sun god Ra. Um, they're often at entrances of temples, but there are less than half of them still in Egypt. Uh, several obelisks were taken without permission to Europe, where many stand today. Uh, for example, in Paris, because of colonial shenanigans. Um, one of the largest obelisks at the front of the Luxor temple, that's here on the left, you'll notice that the one that's supposed to be parallel to it is missing, that's because it's in the middle of Paris. That's the one on the right. Uh, so, And being there at the Luxor Temple and just seeing the one, it looks very lonely and it makes your heart hurt. But anyways. <laughs> they could return it if they wanted to, I guess. It's never too late. Okay, so next we're going to go over the Sphinx, which is another really common uh, motif. Now, we all know the Great Sphinx of Giza. This is the one at the Giza Plateau that was built around the same time to protect those uh, pyramids and burial grounds. However, there are lots of other Sphinx statues around Egypt. Uh, some of them have human heads, some of them have sheep heads. They have all different types, but this is the one that we really know about. The Sphinx, not the, a Sphinx. Yes. <laughs> but uh, ultimately the Sphinx of Giza. Um, so yes, it has the human head with the lion body, and something a lot of people don't know is that it actually has a tail. If you look in the, the blown up picture, if you kind of look towards its butt <laughs> on its back legs, you can see a little tail, which it does have. But what's really fascinating about the uh, Sphinx of Giza is that it has been buried and excavated several times throughout history over the thousands of years that it's existed. Um, there are two really prominent examples of this. Uh, the first one, which was in 1400 BCE, uh, the Pharaoh Thutmose IV, well, before he was Pharaoh, had a divine dream that the Sphinx told him to unbury him. Free him. Free him, and uh, <laughs> and that if he did, he would Thutmose would have divine rule to rule Egypt, and he did. He became pharaoh, and to commemorate that, um, there is a piece of stone that's different than the stone of the Sphinx between its front legs there in the bottom right, um, and that is the dream steel that essentially has his dream on there, and like prophecy of becoming pharaoh. So it's pretty neat. However, even after all that, over the next, you know, couple thousand years, it gets buried again, and it probably has gotten buried again more than that. You're in a desert, there's sand, it's going to build up if nobody's there to take care of it. And a lot of people weren't throughout um, Egyptian history. They, they weren't always doing stuff with the pyramids. Um, the last time this was prominently excavated um, was in, I want to say, did I have it? Yeah, uh, in the 19th century. And so that's the picture there on the left corner, um, of course, when we had actual photographs. And that's what it looked like when they came across it again. And they unburied it, and of course they saw, oh, it has a whole body. Now, of course, it's you know a very coveted World Heritage Site, and no sand's getting on it now, but yeah. Yeah, values change over time on what you're going to preserve and not. So it's like, you know, you preserve your Beanie Babies, you prefer, <laughs> preserve the Sphinx. Different value for different times. So um, going into more symbols, um, 
looking at hieroglyphs. Yeah, so hieroglyphs, um, as we know, is the form of writing um, in Egypt. Now, I don't know how to read them. However, you could look up online if you did want to learn how to read them. They're very picturesque, of course, um, but also the way that it's written and, you know, layers and everything. But again, this is one of those, I think it looks neat. However, in the bottom left um, are what are called cartouches. And these are prominent symbols that you'll see a lot um, on Egyptian artifacts, tombs, um, carvings, and essentially what it is is a name tag. So it is a way of writing names, especially royal names, so that they can be preserved and you would know, okay, who is buried here? Um, you know, whose tomb is this? What, what exactly, who did this belong to? Um, so that is a motif that we're gonna see more of. But whenever you see that symbol with the, uh, the circle and then that flat line at the bottom connecting it, those are cartouches. And one reason why we can understand, like we can decipher what hieroglyphs mean is because of the Rosetta Stone. Hieroglyphs were included as one of the languages that was on the Rosetta Stone. And from there, we just kind of, yeah, backpedal deciphered it. So that's how we're able to read them. So some additional s symbols that you may or may not be familiar with, uh, the scarab or the dung beetle, um, common in the area, um, you, sometimes shown with wings, sometimes not. But the whole deal with rolling a ball is kind of a metaphor, seen as a metaphor for like the day-night cycle. For Ra riding his boat across the sky with the sun, a lot of times the circle is um, like a sunball or something like that as representation of that. The Ankh is kind of the key thing in the middle. Um, that represents the word life and also symbolizes eternity. So you're gonna see that like gods are holding them and different things, or you know, you're w you're wishing good will on somebody. Um, and then the wajet, um, also known as the eye of Horus, is an all-seeing eye representing healing and protection. There is a myth related to this on like how Horus, like his uncle, poked his eye out. He got a new one. It's really rad. That's the story of where this thing comes from. And then at the bottom is really cool hats. So these hats. Um, represent where it's not, our pharaoh hats representing on where they're ruling. So the one where it's just the white, kind of like the bowling pin shape, that's uh, what's considered, let's see, that says the upper kingdom. I can't read the font. Um, but the, and then the, uh, the one that's kind of like a seat is lower kingdom, and then the one with them combined is just everything. So in representations, it's showing like how far they're ruling. Um, but the interesting thing about Upper and Lower Egypt is that they are inverted of what we would think geographically. Upper Egypt is actually the southern part towards kind of the, where the Nile River begins because the Nile flows south northwards. So when we're talking about Upper Egypt, we're talking about the southern part. When we're talking about Lower Egypt, we're talking about the delta where it spits out into the sea up north. Now we get to the family drama. This is one of my favorite parts, and it's the whole mythology of who's who and what's what. So there's different and similar gods among old, middle, and new kin kingdoms. Um, religions evolve over time. They get co-opted by other people later on. A uh, couple of the big names are here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, some that you may commonly see in media. Uh, Ra is the big, the big guy. He's the sun god with the with the falcon head, um, overall supreme creator god. He's the one kind of keeping things in control. Um, Osiris is the green guy. He's a pharaoh god, afterlife. Uh, he was betrayed by Set and killed. Um, he wears the crown of Upper Egypt. Um, he's often depicted with pharaoh stuff because he's essentially the pharaoh, the afterlife. That is his jurisdiction. He's a zombie, too. He is a zombie. We'll, we'll get into that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, Isis is his sister wife. Uh, there was a lot of that. Um, mother of Horus, who is the falcon-headed guy. He represents his parents so well. Um, she 
she's the goddess of life and magic. Uh, her name translates to throne, hence she has the little chair hat. So if you see the chair hat, that's probably Isis, especially with feathers. Um, Horus, we talked about him a little bit. He's the son of Osi Osiris and Isis. He represents power and healing. He's kind of a heroic figure in a lot of the stories that you see. He's one of the most widely depicted deities. Lots of templates to temples are to his honor. He wears the crown of Upper and Lower Egypt, so he's kind of a big deal. Um, Set is kind of the chaotic neutral guy. He's often depicted as evil, but that's not quite accurate. He does some not great things, but he also does some cool things like protecting Ra from snakes. Um, but he also killed Osiris and was kind of a jerk about a lot of other things. But he's depicted in a bunch of different ways, kind of this ant eater thing with ears. He's depicted as like a snake, all kinds of different a creatures. Dragon. A dragon. He's a usurper god. He caused Osiris's death for a power play, and he symbolizes chaos and violence. But sometimes that was seen as a good thing. If you're going to war, you probably want him on your side. He's a nefarious dude. He is. Um, and then Anubis, pretty sure all y'all are familiar with the dog-headed guy. Um, he's one of the most widely known deities. He's the god of the dead. He's the one that's preparing you for the afterlife, weighing your heart. Um, he's widely symbolized in tombs in the Book of the Dead. That's where he we see him pop up a lot. And then some of the other ones down here are pretty interesting, but one more I want to mention is uh, Thoth. He's the official record keeper and the scribe. He's the one that's taking notes. Um, he's a figure of wisdom, and he's often shown as an ibis or a baboon, and he usually has some writing utensil in his hand. Um, the others here are frequently seen and have their own responsibilities and symbolism, so I encourage you to check them out. There's some really cool stories surrounding them. And there's even more than this, too. And then you have the remix version where there's combos of them, and it it gets wild. There's a lot, mm -hmm. and it's very fascinating. It's like a soap opera. It's really yeah. great. <laughs> Um, so one of those stories is the Osiris myth. We kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, this incorporates a lot of the main Egyptian gods. Uh, there's family, betrayal, death, and resurrection. It's all very saucy stuff. Um, so the story goes that Osiris and Isis had a good thing going and Set was really jealous. So he decided to trick Osiris with a present in a box and surprise it killed him. Uh, then he chopped up his body and put it in the river. Isis was not happy about this and found all the pieces and tried to sew them back together and bring him to life and also made Horus in that process. Um, and then Horus went to after Set to get revenge. That's where he got his eye poked out and then, you know, eventually there was a truce, but there's a, there's a little bit of um, tension there. But um, that's one of the big stories with that. Um, another one here is just the process of, like, in the Book of the Dead, how you go about meeting Osiris um, in the afterlife. So here on the left, uh, Anubis is holding hands with somebody who is going to go have their heart weighed against the feather of truth, which means, like, your heart is your representation of your soul. Are you on the naughty list? Are you good or bad? Um, have you been a righteous dude? Have you been a righteous dude? <laughs> if you have, that's great. You get to go over here. Um, Horace introduces you to his parents. It's really great. Um, if not, the hippo lion thing eats your heart. And sorry, the that's the end of the game. Um, anything that was packed with you for the afterlife, somebody's probably going to go get it now. I mean, someone's going to get it either way, but we'll get into that. <laughs> Okay, and yep, here we go getting into that. Uh, mummification is another really common Egyptology thing that we learn about over the years, but it's very fascinating all the different layers that go into it. Um, so it's the process of embalming bodies for burial, but especially for royals, if you uh, pass away, you're getting the VIP treatment here with this. In fact, uh, the whole afterlife and mummification and burial process was so important to these people and their lives that they would have their tombs being built well before they thought they were going to die. So it was like a lifelong project to prepare for the next life, essentially. Um, they would pack them with gold, jewels, treasure, food, wine. You got to make sure you've got food and drinks on the afterlife. You're taking the boat to go meet the gods. You got to have your snacks with you. Um, <laughs> And so there were always several layers to this. What's really fascinating um, 
is that the bottom left picture there is a picture of when King Tut's tomb was opened in 1922. Now we know this is one of the most famous and talked about ones. The reason being this is one of the most intact tombs that has ever been found. Um, many of the other tombs over the years had been pilfered, raided, items lost to time, items sold on the black market, etc. But this one, just about everything was there. It's like storage wars. It's awesome. Yes. Now, it, his tomb is not huge. It's about the size of a one-bedroom apartment. However, each of those rooms was packed with goodies for him. Uh, as you can see here in this room, this was one of the storerooms off of the burial chamber. They have a whole uh, carriage for him. They've got beds. They've got sacks of food and boxes and anything he could possibly need in the afterlife. Um, another thing that's really interesting too is if you, <laughs> on this line of King Tut, um, he, his body is actually back in the tomb, but it's in a glass case. So you can go in and see it and it's just the burial chamber and his mummy just kind of chilling out in the glass case. He looks if, good for his age. Yeah, <laughs> but if you go to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, there is actually an entire wing dedicated to the excavation of this tomb. Uh, they have all of the items that were buried with him spread out, labeled, on display, curated, under security, everything like that. Any of the layers of his coffin, like that titular yeah. one that you see with like the gold and the blue striping, that and all of the several like Matryoshka dolls that go into it, it's just, you know, the, the core is missing because he's back where he's supposed to be. But it's amazing how many layers were buried with his mummy. I mean, there were layers of different types of jewelry, wrapping, just over the top, but it's really cool. Pharaohs are like onions. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they have lots of layers. Um, and then finally with mummification, just touching on the canopic jars, this is where they would um, prepare certain organs and remove them and place these in ceremonial jars for them in the afterlife. Um, now, these four organs had these designated jars. Um, sometimes you'll see them with these heads on them. Those are the sons of Horus. But sometimes you'll see them um, just looking generic pharaoh types. Um, but yes, that's where the organs go. They take the brain out too. Yeah, at the time, like the heart was kind of where your soul and all your thoughts and everything lived. Your brain was kind of, we don't know what to do with it. So we're going to take a straw and kind of break it up and then get it out of your head because you don't need it. Yeah, but of course, the most important organ to them was the heart, which they were weighing in the afterlife uh, based on how their life was. But these other ones are important too. So they're going to send them with good care and they're going to preserve them, you know, just in case. They're sending you with all that food. You got to eat it somehow. Yeah, can't eat it without a stomach. So now we get to, now that you've drunk it from the fire hose, thank you for your patience. Um, <laughs> now it's the fun stuff. Yeah, the really fun let's stuff. Let's apply this to some of the stuff that we see in games. This is by no means comprehensive, but next time you're playing something and you see something, the idea is for you to go, hey. All right, so one of the first examples I ran into this as a kid, uh, we were both big players of point and click computer games. That's all we had access to for a while. Yeah, we didn't have a console. Uh, but one of our favorites was Where in Time is Carmen San Diego. And one of the first kind of like levels or areas of that game is when you uh, time travel to ancient Egypt to catch a thief. But in the process of this, you have to mummify this dude. And you you can, you have to put uh, all the layers on correctly or the burial assistant with the Anubis head freaks out. Um, so like in this one, if you put honey on him, he's like, what are you doing? That is, that's going to attract bugs. That that's is, for eating. Yeah, we're not, we're not doing that. Uh, but you can see in here, if you look where the corpse's head is, if you look down at the end of the bench, ah, uh, there's the four canopic jars. Uh, so it's fun to see 
little details like this um, when you're going through games. And we'll make another appearance with the Canopic jars as well. But yeah, here's some more pictures of what they look like. There's them with the uh, head, the more like Godhead motifs on the right, and then on the left, just a, I don't want to say standard, they're probably carved out of alabaster, but yeah. more uniform looking. <laughs> yeah, and on the back there, there's also more of the materials you use for embalming. Like, it's a process that you have to do it in the right order, have to be time sensitive, things like that. I mean, we kind of do that now. You have to prepare, like morticians have to prepare a body using a lot of different stuff uh, and doing it correctly. <laughs> All right, and then just some more details of this. Again, it's not a big level, but you know, I really like going through it and going down memory lane and then looking at what I've learned and comparing it to now. Uh, so yes, we've got more burial goodies here on the left. We've got the boat that's symbolizing their trip to the afterlife. We've got the food. And I think it's really interesting it's not, it's kind of a similar situation to the Book of the Dead uh, on the screen behind her. So you've got Anubis, you've got Isis there, you've got Thoth, he's ready to take his notes, and you've got Osiris, who you're going to be meeting in the afterlife. So I think that's just a neat detail to include in a kid's game. And this is just a good, this game can be a good primer for getting interested in a lot of different parts of history as a young kid. I wish I could find an emulator for this game. I have been looking for years. If any, if anybody knows, hook me up, please. Yeah, the original game was like a four discs thing that it was like, oh, you gotta put in the next one. So it was honking big. But I think the time thief that you find in this is actually hiding behind one of those doors. And you have to figure out from like who in mythology, which character door to pick to find them. I think that's it. It's been like 20 years. <laughs> Again, still looking for an emulator. Later. I need it. Okay. So now, next to the most historically accurate game, Super Mario 64. <laughs> um, we have pyramids. We have obelisks that are flat on top. We don't see flat obelisks. Not and they're made out of to. red bricks. They're made out of red bricks because that's fun. Um, there's also quicksand as a kid. Um, my husband has made a good point of, as a kid, I was under the impression that quicksand was more of a pervasive danger than it actually was. Um, as far as we can tell, quicksand was not really a part of daily life, um, but it is here. Um, monkey bars, as far as we can tell, are not in pyramids, um, but there is one little detail, and that is, at least when you get inside the pyramid, once you stand on the obelisk and then blow the top of the pyramid off that way, because that's how that works, um, you go into the pyramid, but then you go up the pyramid. So that direction is correct. I'm not really sure if the developers knew that or not, but that's just a nice coincidence. That is one accurate part of this. Also how dark it is on the inside there uh, on the Mario level but if you look to the left that's what the inside looks like in some of those great pyramids. That's another thing here you know looking back to old versus new kingdom with the pyramids of Giza because they're just what 5,000 years old now about um, they don't have a lot of the ornate details that we would expect them to that you see in tombs. Again, like all the hieroglyphics, cartouches, fantastic paintings. It's actually just very plain and dark on the inside. And you go up to the top and there's the burial room and it's literally an open plain granite box. However, it is a very, uh, I don't know, interesting feeling being inside of that. <laughs> yeah, yes, it's dark. <laughs> well, especially like this is with photography and like if you're going through this with a torch and hopefully that doesn't go out, I mean, that's definitely much, much darker. Also, so. they've added wooden stairs in here. I don't think those were always. That's uh, great for accessibility though. Uh, <laughs> All right, Super Mario Odyssey. So bring it to a more recent game. Um, we have a Sphinx here that likes to reappear throughout the game, and he's quite cute. And he's also, he's kind of sassy too. Um, <laughs> now the whole thing with him uh, is that you have to answer riddles, and similar to actual the Sphinx at the uh, Giza Plateau, he is guarding something worth guarding. But in this case, it would be moons or goodies or something. Um, Odyssey Sphinx has no tail. He's quite short, but he's really cute, and he appears in a lot of levels, even outside of the desert levels. He's fun to find. 
All right, another one of my favorite examples from childhood. So, Mario Kart Double Dash was the first console game we ever owned. One of my favorite tracks from that, which is still a favorite, of course, as it was remade in Mario Kart 8, was Dry Dry Desert. Um, I included more pictures from the uh, Eight version just because higher res and they actually went in and add more, added more detail which I think is really fascinating here. Um, of course we have our Sphinx but this time he has a cute Koopa head. But what's really fascinating here is the uh, start and finish line is actually really similar to a really famous temple uh, in the south of Egypt called Abu Simbel. So you can see kind of the similar motif of those giant colossal statues sitting there. And then we also have quicksand again. I have never heard of quicksand in history, but hey, it's there. Well, the thing with also the statues is that those are like pharaohs and important people. So either these Koopas were important politicians or they should be reformatted for Lord Bowser. So we knew that e those Koopas were important. Need their spot in the line. They were important. <laughs> So one of my personal favorites is Banjo-Kazooie. There's a whole level dedicated to this theme. It's Gobi's Valley. We've got the Sphinx here. Um, he has a little stubby tail. I think there's like a, an extra life or something back there. Um, instead of quicksand, we have sand eels. Those are also not accurate as far as we can tell. Eels. <laughs> Um, we do have different kinds of pyramids. We have three triangular pyramids, like prisms, and then we do have a step pyramid. Getting inside that step pyramid is a pain, um, but it is there. It's kind of reminiscent of some other pyramids we see. Um, the, uh, the section for it in Gruntilda's lair is very much formatted like a tomb. We see some reliefs on the walls. Um, and then there's mummies here too. Um, and these are quite resilient. They've been mummified very well. Um, because you can only use an invincibility feather to kill them completely. Um, so they've been very well preserved. They also have really fresh eyeballs for being that old. They do. They just use eye drops. Um, then when you go inside the pyramids, because the cool thing is on this level, you can go inside the pyramids. There's puzzles there too. Um, you can see some reliefs of Banjo-esque figures in an Egyptian dress. Um, the purple there um, has some cartouches on it. We don't know whose names they are. Um, there, in this particular pyramid room, there are four jars. Uh, they do not have organs in them, but they do have special items, and each of the items, I believe, is different. Eggs and feathers. Eggs and feathers. Um, maybe some notes. Maybe some notes, too. Um, and then you have um, imagery on top of one of the pyramids that's slightly reminiscent of Horus. He's often depicted as like a golden shining bird. Um, there's a mummified hand there with treasure, the whole deal with treasure being associated with tombs and mummies. Um, and then getting into the casket, that's where the real treasure is. You can actually open it up and there's a jiggy in there. And then Earthbound, yeah, I heard I that, like yeah. That. I yeah, like that. yeah, I love Earthbound. <laughs> um, so the whole area of Scaraba, um, you can see on the map here in game, there's, uh, there's that wadjet on there. Um, there's also three pyramids. There's a sphinx. You have to answer a riddle from the sphinx or a puzzle to order the pyramid, to open the pyramids. Um, there's kind of a golem mummy. There's some mummies in there to fight. There's a big uh, pharaoh looking golem. Um, and then one of my, one of, I think the coolest enemies in that are these hieroglyphs that come off the walls. We have an Anubis looking guy and we have danger noodle snakes coming out. Uh, snakes are also a common motif. Sometimes you'll see a double headed snake. That's a god. Um, but some cool, you know, flavoring here um, in Earthbound. And plus you have the river going by it, kind of like the Nile. Yeah. It's not flowing the same direction, but it's like off the water and it's in that area. Okay, now this is one of my favorites, and I, I do mean also it is one of my favorite games, but it is also one of my favorite uh, forays into Egyptology and video games because it is just so over the top. Um, Sonic Adventure 2, if you haven't played it, one, go play it. It's on Steam for like $5. Two, that's the end of my plug, I promise. Um, there's a whole section of the game kind of towards the middle of it that's all based around this desert and pyramid area. 
Um, this is, of course, after starting in San Francisco and then going to Pumpkin Land and then, you know, the order that things go in the world. And then from here, you go into space, which is really Yeah, cool. yeah, exactly. You go from the desert into space. And we'll get into that. Um, well, yeah, I think it's really neat here what the developers did when they were building the world um, with these desert and pyramid levels. Because a lot of the levels, you were actually inside the pyramids. Uh, one of the biggest ones, quite literally, and with the most motifs is Knuckles' death chamber, um, which you can see here in the bottom left. See how we've got some gods there, there's some onks there, we've got different hieroglyphs and symbology, and we've got a cartouche in the middle, and guess what? If you dig into the cartouche, that's where you get the treasure. So I think it's neat symbolism showing that it's like yeah, it's showing that something is there, but some of the cartouches actually spit you out in like another part of the death chamber, but like you pop out of a, a different cartouche, so it's like you're going through the wall. Yeah, I think that's a really cool motif. And then um, kind of in the up left hand corner, you also have some fun hieroglyphics and uh, like carvings there. And a lot of the carvings have either echidna or hedgehog heads, which is a cute detail. <laughs> Um, then, <laughs> the story gets deeper, Eggman decides to set up base in the pyramids, because of course he does, and he decides to take this giant stone-carved golem and turn it into a boss. So you get to fight that twice, actually. Um, and of course, we've got our neon hieroglyphics going in the background because this has been Eggmanified to the future. Um, and then, yeah, as you can see in the bottom right, Eggman is turning all these precious things into monuments with his likeness, as one would do. <laughs> All right, here's where we get into space. So, <laughs> despite popular belief, there's not indeed a space shuttle inside of any of the pyramids that we know of. But the, f yeah, I mean, even as a kid playing this, it's like, oh, huh, that's kind of weird. But the older I get, the I'm like, that's just really weird that, th okay, we'll roll with it. You know, we got to suspend a certain amount of belief when we've got anthropomorphic animals and <laughs> huge space colonies and, you know. I just want to know what the door mechanism is on top of the pyramid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is that like, is that still stone? How is that staying on there? Maybe it's that's, that white limestone. I don't know. That's got to be pretty old. Anyways. I love the beginning of when you get to the desert pyramid area because Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles, and Amy are trying to find a way to get to Eggman's station in space. And so they see the desert and like, oh, hey, they went there. Hey, they got to have a rocket to space in there somewhere because of course you do. That's what you have in Egyptian monuments. So I just think it's fun and it uh, makes me chuckle a little bit every time I get to this part of the game. Um, another game very beloved by me is Persona 5, uh, which has also, I'm going to make one more quick plug, sorry, has come out on like all systems now, so you have no excuse not to play it. Anyways, so what I really like is that there's one, uh, one of the temples in the game is entirely tomb and Egyptology themed, which is Futaba's palace. Um, the whole theming of this is that it is her tomb, the tomb inside of her heart. So it's fascinating because you unlock different memories um, of these bad memories that she's trying to hide away in layers of her life as you go through the tomb. And as you work through the palace, you progress to the top of it to the uh, burial chamber. So the going is, up through the pyramid mm -hmm. part. Uh, so you can, but what I think is really neat here, one, uh, you can see like her memories depicted in these like kind of uh, Egyptian-ish paintings. I mean, yes, you've got bird guys in suits, but it's like showing her receiving bad news, but in a but even the bird or animal headedness is kind of in line with that too, like the falcon headed gods. And yeah, everything. yeah. Um, and then another thing about Futaba, the character, well, that's her shadow in the middle, Egyptian themed, of course, but is that she's really into um, coding and technology. And there are lots of parts within this. Uh, this dungeon essentially where they combine the two. So you'll have hieroglyphics and binary, and then you've got really cool, again, neon kind of Egyptian writing throughout the temple. 
Oh, and then... Yeah, and then the final boss of this one is her deceased mother, who is uh, depicted as a griffin here, which is another uh, Egyptian mythological creature. Um, kind of leading more in person Persona and then the Shin Megami Tensei universe, um, I appreciate how they pull personas and demons from lots of different cultural references. So these are some of the ones that they've pulled from Egyptology. Uh, bottom left is Isis. You can see she's got the chair on her head. And she's got feathers and is depicted as a, a goddess. Um, she's part of the priestess arcana, which fits in line with that as well. Uh, then there's Thoth. This time he's depicted as a baboon, but you see he's got his tablet ready to scribe. And on his tablet, he's got the wadgets. Then we've got Anubis in the bottom middle. Um, I appreciate here that it's reminiscent of him weighing the heart. And another interesting fact about this one is this is part of the judgment. Or it was just I, I believe it's either justice or judgment. I think yeah. it's justice. Yeah. I think it's part of the justice persona. So again, in line with that whole is your heart just or not in the afterlife? Um, then we've got Set in the top right. Um, I always thought this was kind of a strange depiction of him, but into further research on it. Uh, so Set was really depicted as one of those first stories that stuck around before a lot of other mythology as the bad guy. Uh, so while he's depicted as that anteater we saw before, he's also depicted sometimes as snakes and then sometimes kind of as an evil spirit. So in this, they translated that to a big dragon. Um, and then finally, in the bottom right, we've got Horus. He's the golden falcon. And uh, he is also part of the Sun Arcana. Yeah, kind of reminiscent to the Sun Discs and also relation to Ra. And he's kind of like the light figure. <laughs> How many of you were waiting for us to get to Pokemon? <laughs> um, this one's a little bit obvious, but Lucario based off of Anubis, design-wise, but also kind of the idea of reading auras and judging people's souls. Um, so that little tidbit kind of relates to Anubis as well. Um, Yum Mask and uh, Kappa Grigus. Uh, Yum Mask is kind of like a death mask, or used to be a human soul. He's got a little uh, bit there. And then Kappa Grigus, sarcophagus. Um, that one's pretty on the nose. It's even got some of the coloring like uh, King Tut's uh, sarcophagus, uh, Relor, which is roller backwards, and Rabska, which is a scarab. Um, those are from the latest generation, Scarlet and Violet. Um, I think it's really interesting that the way that you evolve Relor is you walk around with it long enough, it rolls its ball long enough, it completes that cycle, kind of like reminiscent of the whole moving the sun across the sky motif, and then it like reaches enlightenment and turns into the psychic bug thing that looks even more like um, the scarab imagery that you would see. One thing I will say is as they add in new generations over time, I have my fingers crossed they will do one based on Egypt someday. They are sitting on gold here, Pokemon Company. There's some really good fake them on accounts yes. of artists that you'll see really cool renditions of stuff. Um, how many of y'all played the Clue Finders <laughs> games? I'm glad we're not the only ones. Our parents were like edutainment until the GameCube came around. <laughs> um, so I mostly played third grade, but fourth grade was a cool one because yeah, it all takes place in Egypt. We see some different motifs here. There's the whole alabaster pillars that are painted. There's like a mini game with that, with a contractor. Um, there's the whole, you know, how you're rolling the bricks to build the pyramids. Um, up there in the top right. That's probably, in my opinion, the coolest puzzle. You got Thoth there with the you know, writing utensil, um, keeping track of how you're doing with this spelling knowledge game. Um, and on the sides are baboons, which are also Thoth um, adjacent. Um, and then, yeah, they just depicted like Isis, either, I think that's think Horus. Horus. Yeah, and then Bastet and... Um, is it Sekhmet? No, Sobek. Sobek, um, right. Who was in one of the previous slides. We haven't touched on him a lot. He's like the Nile guy. Um, and then, yeah, Set, he's kind of in the anteater bit. Spoiler alert, the 
the weird researcher, evil guy, mustache twirler turns into Seth. I mean, spoiler alert, this game came out in 1997. <laughs> yeah, and also trying to, you know, find a ROM hack for this one. So if y'all have played this at all, you know, make my heart a flutter and tell us how to get it. <laughs> but this one's just a, a fun romp in that, and it's neat to see the direct, you know, inspiration for this. All right, and most recently, one of my recent favorites is Bayonetta 3. Um, also a really cool game that pulls on a lot of cultural references. Um, it, they expand beyond the just like your European uh, witch styles. Uh, there is a whole, okay, spoiler alert, but uh, it's not really, they put it in the trailers. Uh, Bayonetta 3 is a multiverse model, so you have sep like different uh, realities that uh, Bayonetta is in, and one of them is an Egyptian-themed one. Uh, they, you know, aside from a lot of generic looking uh, paintings and hieroglyphics, they don't have a lot of specifics that I wanted to stand out. However, in that whole like world, they have a lot of um, Horus looking figures, but that have the moons on their heads instead of suns because the Umbran witches are represented by moons instead. There's also a bird headed god that kind of represents the moon. If you've watched Moon Knight, you know what we're talking about. So, birds, suns, and moons, if you walk away with anything. <laughs> and yeah, here's just more of those um, paintings. I really try to take some good screenshots here, but that level is so dark on the inside of the tomb. Hey, it's dark on the inside, like it would be. Um, and there's also quicksand in it now that I think about it. <laughs> Watch out for the quicksand. Um, but yeah, anyways, there's a lot of really cool depictions and ways they kind of like witchified things. It's kind of cut off here, but there's a frog statue on the right uh, that they had as some frog god in this with like spider web looking stuff. So I think it's interesting that they took a lot of stuff and they've got a lot of like normal Egyptian looking stuff in and then you'll just see like, bam, here's this like witchified one. Yeah, like I see like there's a Osiris there with his arms crossed and he's wearing the funerary white mm -hmm. or pharaoh white and stuff. So there's a couple of like actual ones in there. And then also real quick, I mean, she's bedazzled head to toe with the, you know, almost funerary looking Egyptian uh, gold, diamonds, jewels, all that fun stuff. So I know that was a lot. Thank you for bearing with <laughs> us. Um, if you are interested in additional media, we have some recommendations. Um, yes, this is a JoJo reference. Um, part three is like their stands and stand users. The stands that they have are named after Egyptian gods. And their they powers. Go to Egypt. They do. They go to Egypt to defeat Dio. Um, but a lot of the stands, they're named after gods and their powers are kind of adjacent to what that god would do. Also, Oingo and Boingo are at Abu Simbel. Yep, look for them at Abu Simbel. Um, the book on the left, when Caroline told me she was going to Egypt, I was like, do I have a graphic novel for you? I very much recommend this graphic novel. Um, it's just kind of a, a telling of some of the like foundational stories of Egyptian mythology. It's very cheeky. It's it goes, it's a lot of fun. It is. Yeah, it goes a lot of, over that Osiris myth, but the way that it's written is very cheeky and just a fun read. And honestly, like. I was like, oh cool, I'm gonna read this novel before I go, and it's really short, and it's like, oh, this will be fun. It helped me so much when I was over there to have that backstory on some of these gods that were often depicted. So yeah, it's a graphic it, novel, so it's a quick read. But it's very educational, so we highly recommend it. And it's just, it's it's written really fun. Yeah, um, Ologies is a really good science podcast. It's been nominated and won a bunch of awards. It's hosted by Allie Ward. They. Uh, I believe she has a couple episodes on Egyptology. Yeah, there's um, an Egyptology. That's worth a listen if you're driving home after the con, put this on. Um, Prince of Egypt is a cool movie. Um, it has a lot of imagery in that. It's telling a biblical story, but you know, there's a lot of you know historical aspects in that too. And well, the soundtrack slaps. And the soundtrack slaps. <laughs> it does. Um, yeah, every Passover, our 
our nephew watches it, so when he's three, they're starting early. Um, and then the mummy. Um, there's also the ride at Universal. I Scarabs. Got <laughs> scarabs, yes, scarabs. That is like quick, not quicksand, but scarabs are the real enemy there. Yeah. Um, the ride at Universal, um, I could not handle it just because I get motion sick, but I've been told it's very cool. Um, but the movie is also a movie about that. <laughs> Mostly bugs. Mostly bugs. And a um, mummy. And a mummy. So yeah, the mummy is in it. But other than that, thank you so much for coming out tonight. We know that you're just getting started with MacFest. Um, my sister here is on, we are both on Instagram. Caroline is at Callerline. Yes, that is how it's spelled. Um, she's also a great cosplayer. Um, I'm at Aimsadoodle. Um, I get in a costume sometimes. Uh, if you have questions, we'll hang around for a little bit, but thank you so much for your time thank and attention. You, we hope you have a wonderful weekend.